So, what is this? I can mean? share my screen if you want uh, me Yeah, you can share your screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can share your screen. Uh, nice, good. So we have the, the pleasure to welcome uh, Laura Sanita for, uh, for opening the session of this afternoon. Uh, so I, I think I don't need to, to introduce you, Laura Sanita, but I will introduce her for only with a few words. Laura Sanita was a researcher in, um, professor in, uh, in the University of Waterloo in the famous Department of Combinatorial Optimization. And uh, Laura Sanita has uh, worked in combinatorial optimization, many aspects of combinatorial optimization in uh, network design from uh, approximation algorithm, algorithmic game theory, uh, polyhedra. She, she contributed to, to, to for solving a very hard problem and publishing in a very high rank uh, journal in our community and conferences among them, for example, Soda, Fox, or Ripco. And she, she is in the program committee of, uh, of many also like Soda, Ipco. She, and uh, next, uh, she will organize the, the next Ipco in, uh, in Netherlands. And now she, she, in fact, she is a uh, professor in the University of, uh, of Eindhoven. Uh, so uh, we have a uh, pleasure to, to welcome her. She will talk uh, this afternoon about uh, the diameter of the circuit, uh, uh, about the circuit diameter of a polytop, which is at the same time as, uh, when, you have, when you know this diameter, which is very important because it will give you also a lower bond of the classical uh, diameter, which is a very, very hot uh, subject in, uh, in uh, combinatorial optimization and polyhedra. So Laura, you have uh, one hour for uh, for presenting. Okay, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the very nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, here, although virtually uh, for now. So yeah, as you uh, mentioned, so the subject of my talk is about diameter and circuit diameter of uh, polytopes. And actually, these are concepts that, as you already introduced, play a key role in the, the theory of linear programming. So let's give a brief uh, introduction and uh, overview of the concept. So uh, I don't have to explain to this audience what uh, linear programming is. I guess all of you are very, very familiar with that, clearly. So uh, linear programming concerns the problem of maximizing or minimizing a, a linear function on decontinuous variables subject to a finite set of linear constraints. And so we are talking about objects of this kind. And uh, linear programs are very uh, important, uh, we all know, because they can be used to model several optimization problems. And even more, they are a fundamental tool for solving a harder problem, for example, integer programming, that means optimization problem with the discrete uh, variables, because the techniques of branch and bound or cutting plane, they anyway rely on solving iteratively the class of linear programs. They are heavily used um, in uh, approximation algorithms. Uh, LP-based techniques are, um, are strongly employed uh, to develop uh, solutions and proofs that actually they are near optimal. And also in practice, uh, they have a tremendous impact. Uh, commercial solvers also heavily rely on uh, linear programming techniques. And so this uh, gives a huge impact in the operation research industry, data science, and so on. So given that linear programming is so fundamental, how about algorithms for solving linear programs? Well, the development of algorithms started already in the 40s and probably uh, uh, the um, one of the most famous one uh, for sure is the simplex algorithm invented by George Dunsing is uh, 1947. And nowadays the simplex algorithm is extremely popular and uh, widely used in practice and indeed <laughs> named as one of the top 10 algorithms of the 20th century by, by Science News. So very briefly, um, what is so uh, nice about the simplex uh, algorithm. Well, the simplex algorithm in a way uh, is very combinatorial in nature, I would say. So it exploits the fact that the set of physical solution of an LP, of course, has a very nice structure. So it is given by uh, the intersection of finitely many inequalities. So every linear inequality basically divide, uh, divide your space. So if you intersect a finite number of them, 
you end up with the region of, uh, of potential feasible solution that is a convex set this is called the polyhedra or a polytopic bounded. And in this particular case here, for example, it's not too difficult to realize that uh, if you want to maximize or minimize a linear function over this uh, set of blue points, basically what you want, you want to take this uh, linear function in a way, intuitively you're trying to push this in a direction as much as you can until you still have some intersection with this uh, set of feasible points. And so it's not difficult to realize that you can, in this case, uh, try to find an optimal solution at one of the extreme points of the feasible region. That means uh, one of these uh, uh, corner points over here. And uh, so then the simplex algorithm idea, it's kind of, uh, in a way, um, uh, very nice. So basically, it's somewhat try to guess an initial uh, feasible solution that is one of this corner point. And then it moves from an extreme point to an improving adjacent one until the optimum is found. So something like this. Okay, so that's quite nice. And the operation of moving from one extreme point to another is called pivoting. Now, pivoting is actually quite a crucial operation in the performance of the simplex algorithm because actually the pivoting rule clearly defines the path followed by the algorithm. So technically speaking, you could have several paths that brings you to an optimal solution. You could have several um, extreme points adjacent to your current one that improve your, your uh, objective function. And so the pivoting rule basically relies to understand how to uh, answer to this question. How should we choose the next improving extreme point? And of course, different uh, answers to this question will give you different path from uh, your initial solution to the optimum one. And dancing pivoting rule uh, in initially um, is one that actually um, makes a lot of sense intuitively. So try to move along an edge of the polytope that seems more promising in terms of cost function improvement. On the other hand, it took uh, a bit of years, but uh, cleaning teams in the 70s, they show that pivoting according to this rule might require an exponential uh, number of steps in, uh, in the dimension of the polytope. They achieved that by basically taking a d-dimensional hypercube and perturbated a bit and showing that if you move according to this rule, then you might take exponential number of steps in general. Of course, that's just one rule. Um, what about other pivoting rules? And during these years, uh, many, many pivoting rules have been proposed in the literature. Just to mention a few, they're not all, but you know, there is also greatest improvement, Blanc's rule, steepest edge, random pivot rule, uh, Cunningham's others, and so on. But I mean, for uh, many of them, the one that have been able somehow to be analyzed, uh, they turned out to exhibit a worst case uh, sub-exponential behavior for, uh, for the simplex algorithm. And in fact, um, this is, I mean, there are some results in the literature that show that this is somewhat uh, to be expected, at least for some of the rules, uh, because uh, the simplex algorithm, for example, with dancing rule, can be shown to be able to implicit solve hard problems. And um, I mean, this is a quite more recent line of, uh, of work, but in a way you can implement the simplex algorithm with Danzig rule and on some particular instance and looking at the behavior of the simplex, so looking at the um, which kind of extreme points you visited, you can actually be able to determine whether an original NPR problem um, has is a yes or a no instance. So in a way, this kind of is giving an, an explanation to the fact that, you know, for example, with this pivot rule, you should expect to have an exponential behavior. So um, is there a polynomial pivoting rule? Well, after more than seven years of using and uh, study the simplex algorithm, we still do not know the answer. Now, let's say that uh, we do know that solving uh, linear programs can be done in polynomial time because we have other algorithms that are able to do that. So for example, the ellipsoid algorithm or interior points method. So one could say, okay, but we do have algorithms for solving linear programs in polynomial time. Why do we care too much about analyzing particular the simplex? Well, um, however, 
such algorithms that we have for linear programs, see, they run in what is called the weekly polynomial time. So the running time is polynomial in, in the dimension of the polytope, in the number of facets, or inequality, if you, if you want to simplify. And they kind of depend in a polynomial way uh, by the, the size of the largest coefficient. And uh, instead, having, for example, um, a polynomial uh, pivoting rule for the simplex algorithm, of course, one that is not that too complicated to implement in a way, could imply what is called a strongly polynomial time algorithm for linear programs. And uh, where that means that the number of elementary operation would be polynomial in the number of different in input value, but it would not be dependent of, uh, of this log L here. So it would be independent on basically the size of the coefficient. Um, and so the existence of a strongly polynomial time algorithm for linear program is actually one of the big uh, open questions in the area in this field of mathematics. And in fact, it's mentioned as one of the mathematical problems from next century by the Fields medalist uh, Stevens made in, uh, in 2000. So um, also, I would say that uh, I say this many times, the simplex algorithm is probably this, the first algorithm that we all uh, learn to solve linear programs. At least that was the first one I, I, I learned as an undergrad. As I said before, it's very combinatorial in nature. And for me, I kind of really like that. So in a way, it has this potential to maybe be able to help in the quest of strongly polynomial time algorithm for, for LPs. So I think this is a very uh, deep and, uh, and exciting area of, uh, of research, although as you may guess, uh, quite difficult because uh, yeah, many people have studied this before. But okay, so that's kind of the motivation to try to understand a bit more what is the performance of the simplex algorithm. But you can see that from here, it's kind of easy to get um, uh, intuitively close to a related question. So has the simplex algorithm ever have a chance to, to you know, to be implemented with some, you know, polynomial pivoting rule that guarantees a polynomial path. In other words, uh, the simplex algorithm takes an extreme point and move to another one at the end of the day. That is the one that corresponds to an optimal solution of your LP. So what is the minimum length of such a path between two extreme points of a polytope? So suppose that someone is able to provide you the best, the perfect polynomial pivoting rule. Uh, can you can you then still guarantee? Can you not still? Can you guarantee that uh, there exists a path that will allow you to reach to an optimal solution in polynomially many steps? And so this basically leads to the concept of diameters. So whenever we are given a polytope, uh, we can uh, naturally associate to this polytope an underrated graph where the vertices they correspond to the extreme point of the polytope. They are so-called vertices of the polytope. And the edges are given by the one-dimensional faces of your, of your polytope, or um, in other words, um, what is called also edges of the polytope. So here, if we take this example in which we have this, uh, this polytope here, that would be the graph that corresponds to it. And now with this, the diameter is defined as the maximum value of a shortest path between a pairs of vertices on this graph. So it's precisely the same concept of diameter of a, of a graph. In this case, it's this one. So um, again, in order for a polynomial pivoting rule to exist, a necessary condition is to have a polynomial bound on the value of the diameter. So what is known about that? Well, um, a famous conjecture that is not a conjecture anymore was proposed by Hirsch in the, in uh, 57. It was called the Hirsch conjecture, stating that the diameter of a d-dimensional polytope with n facet was bounded by n minus t. Now, this uh, conjecture was disproved first for unbounded polyhedra, and then uh, roughly 10 years ago for bounded one by uh, Francisco Santos. Yeah, on the other hand, um, the, the, the example that actually disproves the Hill conjecture shows that the bounds of n minus t is a little bit too, uh, too tight, so it uh, uh, doesn't hold. On the other hand, it shows that it is violated by a factor of 1 plus epsilon. So it could still be true that uh, it could be, uh, you know, by, by taking um, just um, you know, a polynomial factor of uh, n minus t, it could still be true that uh, this is enough to bound the diameter. 
So just one thing that actually I forgot, it holds this bound for many classes of polytope, although it's not two in general. So for example, for zero one polytopes, so they behave uh, nicely with respect to this bound. And as I said before, uh, the polynomial version, we don't know for more general polytopes. And so the, this is what is called the polynomial conjecture. It's still open whether you can find uh, a polynomial function f that depends on, um, let's say, the dimension and the number of facets that could bound the, uh, um, in general, the diameter of a polytope. And to say, I mean, there are plenty of results about diameter of polytopes. It's really impossible to survey all of them. Uh, let's say that, that the currently best bound is kind of uh, this form. So it depends, um, uh, it's quasi polynomial in, in, uh, in D. Um, so since the, the concept of diameters of polytope plays such a central role, it has been studied from many different perspectives. And for example, many researchers studied the diameter of polytopes that describe the set of feasible solution of famous combinatorial optimization problems. And again, here there will be a long list, but just to mention a few, uh, you know, the diameter of matching polytope, TSP, flows of transportation, edge cover, stable marriage, stable set, and so on. Many of these problems uh, have been studied with respect to, to the concept of diameter. And the diameter has also been investigated from a computational complexity point of view. So in particular, Fries and Tang in 94, showing that computing the diameter of a polytope is a weekly NP-hard problem. And uh, yeah, a few years ago, I actually strengthened this result by showing that computing the diameter of a polytope is in fact strongly NP-hard. And even more like computing a pair of vertices and maximum distance is uh, APX-hard. So there is a small constant uh, within uh, which you cannot hope to, uh, to approximate with this, this problem. And I think what is actually most important about these results is that it holds for a very easy and well understood uh, class of polytopes. And in particular, it holds for half integral polytopes that uh, with a very easy description, and in particular for the so-called uh, fractional matching polytope. So um, again, the first now part of the talk, I will say a few more words about this result, and I'll take it as a start base to then uh, generalize it a bit and, and move to, uh, to circuit diameter as well. So, um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about this kind of, uh, of results. Uh, so to do that, I have to step back a bit. So before introducing the fractional matching polytope that I will, uh, I will uh, describe uh, soon, uh, let's step back and let's uh, talk about the so-called matching polytope. Okay, one thing I forgot to say actually is that I am I don't see when I am in this uh, mode of uh, for for the lectures I don't see if there are questions you know in the chat or something so I trust that uh, that you would interrupt me and and uh, just speak loud if that is the case okay good yes yeah okay everybody oh. is to do okay good okay so. Uh, Again, so let's talk a little bit about the matching polytope and let's see what we can say about the diameter of this polytope. So the matching polytope is defined by considering matchings on graphs. So a matching is a subset of edges that have no node in common. In this example, the set of red edges form a matching. Now um, you can associate given a graph, a polytope, uh, to, to, uh, to it by considering the set of edges that forms matchings in your graph in the following way. Yeah, you can consider every matching uh, as a zero one vector in the dimension of the, the edges of your graph in which you have a zero if the edge is not in the matching and the one if an edge is in the matching. So every matching can give you a zero one uh, vector. And with this, then the matching polytope is going to be defined as the convex hull of characteristic vectors of matching is in G. Like in this example, if we have a triangle as our graph, we have four matchings. One is the empty matchings that corresponds to zero, zero, zero. Then we have a matching in which we only take the edge one. And so this would correspond to the vector one, zero, zero. Then we have the matching in which we take the second edge, the matching in which we take the third, and uh, this gives us this four point here, stream points. We take the convex cell and that's precisely the matching polytope. Now, um, 
Edmonds in 65 gave a linear programming description of the matching polytope. So it shows precisely which one are the inequalities that are necessary uh, and actually sufficient to, uh, to describe uh, the set of, um, of uh, points in your convex holes. Oops, sorry. To describe the set of points in your convex hole. And uh, so uh, has this some consequences in terms of, uh, of a diameter? What can we say about it? Well, um, in a way, it is, this problem is a problem defined on graphs. So it is not difficult to imagine that, uh, that maybe adjacency of two extreme points on the polytope somehow can have some, uh, some uh, graphical characterization. And that's, in fact, what happens. So Baliski, Rusakov, and Schwatal in, uh, in the 70s show that two vertices of the matching polytope, they are adjacent if and on if. If you take the symmetric difference of the corresponding matchings, they induce precisely one connected component. Now, um, if you take the symmetric difference of uh, two matchings, there are not that many uh, ways in, in which this graph can look like. So uh, matching is a subset of edges and every node is incident into at most one edge. So if you take two matchings and take the symmetric difference, you end up in, with, the, with the graph in which every node has degree at most two. One uh, degree comes from one matching and one other incidence edge can possibly come for the other matching, but no more than that can happen. So the symmetric difference of two matchings is actually a union of vertex disjoint cycles and paths. So what this is saying is the following. You take two matchings, take the symmetric difference. If you have exactly one alternating cycle or exactly one alternating path, then the two matchings are adjacent on the polytope, otherwise they are not. And once you have this kind of, of graphical interpretation of, of adjacency, it is also not very difficult uh, to give a bound on uh, the diameter. And in fact, as a consequence, the diameter of the matching polytope uh, can be proved to be equal to the size of a maximum matching. So the diameter of the matching polytope is equal to the cardinality of the maximum matching of the corresponding graphs. And now uh, let me write it that way. So I'm saying that the diameter of the matching polytope is equal to the maximum or taken over all vertices of your polytope of the function one transpose x. So if you imagine to maximize one transpose x over the, uh, your polytope here, you basically would like to find a vector that, uh, that basically is of maximum uh, cardinality here with respect to the matching. This corresponds to maximizing one transpose x over this LP. And the maximum value that you get is actually equal to the diameter. Um, just to give you an intuition, the vertices that actually uh, realize this maximum distance are the empty matching and the matching the, uh, maximum cardinality. Because if you think about it, to move from the empty matching to the matching that is maximum cardinality, in a way, if you look at the adjacency, you see that in each step, the cardinality either stays the same if we move along an alternating uh, cycle, or it can increase by one if you move along an alternating path. So in a way, you from going from the empty matching to a matching of maximum cardinality, you need maximum cardinality many steps to, uh, to reach it. And this could also be easily seen to be a, a, an upper bound, also the narrower bound. So you have an exact characterization of the diameter of the matching polytope. And since we do have an algorithm uh, for finding a matching of maximum cardinality, again, by seminal result, uh, result of Edmonds, this also shows that you can compute the diameter of the matching polytope in polynomial time. OK, so that's good. Now, what about the fractional matching polytope? So the fractional matching polytope is given by the standard LP relaxation of, of matching that basically corresponds to remove this set of constraints here, the, the outside inequality constraint. So it's given by just taking non-negativity constraints and the constraints of uh, the degree constraints for your nodes. So for every node, you want to take at most uh, one edge. And so fractionally speaking, the sum of the x values on the edges around every node v should be at most one. Now, this is a well-known 
polytope, and it is not an integral polytope, of course, because we need the outset inequality to have integrality. So, I mean, in general, it's not um, an odd, it's not an integral polytope. In fact, can have fractional extreme points. So, if we go back to the previous example, this one was the matching polytope, right? Now, fractionally, what could happen is that you could give 0 0.5 value here, 0 0.5 value here, and 0 0.5 value here. And you can see that this satisfies the degree constraints and it is non-negative. So this is, in fact, uh, a point which is not included in this, in this convex cell. And this, uh, one can show that this is indeed an extreme point. And in fact, uh, the fractional uh, matching polytope for this graph is look like this. So as you see, we have this one uh, extra vertex that we had it. Now, in this case, uh, this vertex has uh, half integral coordinates because here the values are one half. And actually, this is not kind of a coincidence uh, because Balinski proved in the 70 that this is always the case. So the fractional matching polytope is an half integral polytope. And even more, so if you take a, an extreme point of your polytope, then basically you only have zero, one half, and one value, but even more. So the edges at the value one, of course, necessarily needs to induce a matching uh, because there cannot be any other things adjacent to, to every of these nodes. But if you consider the edges that have a value one half, then you can prove that in a, in a vertex of the polytope, these edges they have to induce a collection of odd disjoint cycles. So you have something more or less like this. You have some edges with value zero, some edges with value one that actually they form partially matching. And then you have a set of vertex disjoint odd cycles given by the set of edges that have a value one half. So uh, let's call this set of edges like in this way, calligraphic C of X. Okay, then. Um, what happens is that, so this is well known since the 70s, how about uh, um, adjacency? Well, also adjacency were kind of uh, uh, studied before, but uh, the value of the diameter uh, was not known until a few years back. And once we have this, we can now state at least the characterization of the diameter of the fractional matching polytope that is actually as follows. As follows. So the diameter of the fractional matching polytope is equal to the following quantity. You maximize over your vertices of your polytope, one transpose x. So in a way, this is similar to what happened before. So you are trying to find the point that has kind of a, a large uh, support uh, value, basically. Uh, I mean, here, large one norm if you want to sum all the entries. But now you also have these extra terms. And this is basically the number of odd cycles in your support divided by two. So in a way, the way I think about it is the following. You, similar to before, as I said, you're maximizing in a way the, uh, the size of your fractional matching. But now you can also enlarge the value of the diameter if you're able to find the point that has a lot of odd cycles in your support because this, I mean, this quantity here is also going to, to be counted. And, okay, so just to give a, an example, just a sanity check. So if you have a bipartite graph, for example, a bipartite graph does not have odd cycles. So this kind of object cannot show up. So in this case, uh, you know, this quantity will go away and we go back to the same value that we had before for the matching polytope. Has to be expected because if you have a bipartite graph, then uh, the outset inequality are redundant. So the, the fractional matching polytope is basically the integral matching polytope. And so you go back with the, with the previous result. And yeah, that's basically what is happening. But in general, for general graph, the, what this is basically saying intuitively is that if you are able to have a lot of odd cycles in your support, then the diameter uh, becomes uh, becomes larger. And um, yeah, so I mean, the proof is not uh, straightforward um, at all. Uh, so I mean, I won't I will uh, skip it for this long, uh, long, I mean, uh, for this um, uh, plenary talk. Uh, but okay, so in a way, it uses uh, 
the, the adjacency of uh, of the of the fractional matching polytopes and try to uh, you know to to use them in order to prove uh, to prove this bound. But once you have done this, like prove this characterization, then actually the results about hardness follows quite uh, quite easily. So the fact that computing the diameter of a polytope is strongly NP-hard, now in a way it can be seen easily if you think about the reduction from uh, the NP-hard problem of uh, partition into triangles. So um, what is this problem? partition into triangles, well, okay, so in this problem, we are given uh, a graph G, and we are asking whether the set of nodes can be partitioned into some sets B1, B2, up to VQ, such that for every set, VI induces a triangle. Okay, so basically, um, I mean, we are given a, we are given a graph, and you would like to to partition the set of vertices into disjoint triangles. And when what the triangles, the triangles should be a triangle that is induced by by the three vertices that you take. And now, if if you think about it, and uh, and uh, you think about the bound here. Well, when you have a partition of the set of nodes into triangles, like uh, in, in your graph, is uh, something like this exists, then really both these two quantity, they are their, their maximum possible value. Because, I mean, one transpose x, so the sum of, um, of the value of x will be basically number of nodes divided by two. Because here, if you imagine 0 0.5 on each edge, so basically that's what you get, which is an upper bound on whatever this quantity can be. It can never be more than number of nodes divided by two. And, and if you think about this, this is the number of odd cycle in the support divided by two. Also, this would be a value of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, number of nodes uh, divided by, by three. The, the number of odd cycle could be uh, at most number of nodes divided by three, because really in the in the best case, you are actually to, able to produce these many triangles in your graph. So this values here is at the top, top possible, that would mean number of nodes divided by two plus number of nodes divided by six. And that's the top maximum, if and only if you have a graph in which um, you are able to find a partition of the set of nodes into this joint set of triangle, which is precisely the partition into triangle problem. So yeah, so this is basically showing that uh, that where the hardness comes from. It comes from this particular characterization in which the number of cycles that you're able to create comes into, into the definition of, um, of the maximum value that you can have. And so once you have this, I hope that, uh, that this is uh, more or less uh, believable. Okay, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, showing the slightly um, uh, more uh, uh, hardness result, uh, again, comes from using partition into triangle is in his uh, optimization ver version, that is the finding a maximum number of disjoint triangles in the graph is a Pixar, and so you can imagine that uh, more or less uh, using uh, similar uh, arguments, one can translate this also in the result regarding the diameter. So that's um, one thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, but now, if we want to go back a little bit about uh, maybe the simplex, uh, does this previous result uh, have some hardness implications on the performance of the simplex algorithm? And actually, the answer is uh, not really in the current form. So uh, the hardness of the computing the diameter it comes from basically the existence of non-existence of a vertex with a certain structure. Uh, as I said before, it basically it comes for, if you think about partition into triangle, the existence of non-existence of, of this subset of, uh, of triangles that partition the set of vertices. So in a way, it is not really, cannot be really translated into some kind of hardness result uh, related to the performance of the simplex algorithm. Yeah, on the other hand, um, if you further exploit the polytope, you can actually remedy to this and derive more hardness results. Uh, 
So in particular, um, another result that I want to mention that this is a joint work with uh, Sus de Loera from UC Davis and uh, Sean Kaffer, that is a, um, my PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Uh, we actually proved uh, that if you have an extreme point of even the bipartite matching polytope, so that this is actually 0-1 polytope. So if given an extreme point of this polytope and an objective function, it is actually MP hard to decide whether there is a neighboring extreme point that is uh, that is optimal. So again, what this is saying is that you're basically uh, consider a, an extreme point here and uh, you are given a, a, an objective functions somehow to optimize. And, and you know, these extreme points on the polytope can have plenty of adjacent uh, neighboring point. If you consider the generate polytopes that could be uh, clearly exponentially many. And so understanding whether you do have one adjacent uh, extreme point that is that is optimal is actually um, an MP hard problem. So what this means is that basically uh, it's MP hard to decide if uh, given an initial point like this one, is MP hard to decide whether you could reach an optimal solution just with one augmentation or whether like you need at least two. Uh, yeah, because if you don't have any neighboring uh, uh, extreme point that is optimal, then you would need uh, at least two hops here to, to reach an optimal solution. So in fact, as a corollary of, of this, then you can say that finding the shortest monotone path to an optimal solution is uh, is MP hard and hard to approximate within a factor better than two. And in fact, I mean, uh, so this we basically we reprove this using the 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 bipartite matching polytope. Um, a similar results could be derived also from a result of Barahona and Tardos already in '89. They were studying the the circulation polytope. If you look at this paper, it's not. Uh, I mean, this is not stated this way, but uh, but in a way you can uh, you can easily derive for that. So what this implies is that basically for any efficiently uh, efficiently computable pivoting rule, any kind of edge augmentation algorithm, any augmentation algorithm that, that moves along the edges of your polytope like simplex uh, cannot reach the optimal solution with a minimum number of augmentation. And also this number of augmentation cannot be approximated with something better than two. Now, uh, here I said monotone, but it's really even if you replace monotone with something else, even if you are allowed to move to vertices by decreasing a bit your objective function and so on, this still holds because it really, the hardness really comes from deciding whether you have a neighbor extreme point right next to you and then you just need one hope or uh, this uh, optimal solution somewhere else, and then you will need at least two hopes. So independently on whether you want, what I'm saying here is that here you can also remove monotone if you want, and the, the result is, uh, is still true. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, so we, we know at this point that, um, yeah, that this augmentation algorithms like this, uh, they, um, yeah, cannot really hope to reach an optimal solution with a minimum number of augmentation. One thing that I want to stress out though, is that this kind of results, um, uh, there are also uh, other type of similar result uh, by uh, other group of researchers like Jean Cardinal and all that uh, recently, um, last year or two years ago, they proved something similar for the um, uh, for the perfect matching, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Although the the hardness of approximation is uh, is not two, it's like three half. But anyway, all of these type of results they really heavily use the fact that the polytope is degenerate. So if you have the polytope that is not degenerate, then of course the number of neighbors is uh, is clearly polynomial, right? Uh, because you cannot have uh, uh, more than uh, dimension many, and so uh, then this hardness of understanding whether you have an optimal neighboring addition to extreme points or not clearly doesn't hold anymore. And that would be uh, like, so having a result of this type, but 
for uh, non-degenerate polytope, so what is so-called simple polytope, that would be a much stronger result. So that's I want to I want to highlight. I will get back to that uh, at the end. Okay, so so far so good. That's more or less what um, uh, is the status for um, hardness related to normal diameter. Now, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the generalization of uh, the concept of diameter, which is called the circuit diameter of a polytope. So the circuit diameter of a polytope has been formalized um, quite, I mean, not so long ago by Borkbart, Finnold, and Hameke. And it is based on the notion of, uh, of circuits that instead have a very long uh, history in optimization. So what are circuits? Well, um, very informally, circuits are given by the set of all potential edge direction that can arise by translating the sum of, uh, of the facets of the polytope. And once you have this, you can define the circuit diameter has the maximum value of the shortest path between two extreme points, assuming that now you can move along any possible circuit as long as you move maximally. This is much easier to explain with an example. So if we have a polytope like this, and we consider, for example, this vertex, okay? Now, whenever we want to move to another vertex, so for example, this vertex over here, with a normal concept of diameter, Starting from here, we would have only two possibility for moving. We either go along this direction or we move along this direction, okay? Now, when we talk about circuit diameter, we could use any circuit. So, and what is a circuit? They are all edge direction that can arise by translating some of the facets. So for example, if you, if you consider this, uh, this is, a facet, if you imagine to, trans to, to move it, I mean, this is in two dimensions. So if you imagine to translate this over here, this is going to give you now another possible direction that you can take. So uh, instead of these two, now circuits are actually a way to enlarging the set of direction that you can use. And in this case, you can see that uh, we can go to this from, from this vertex to this vertex in two steps if we move maxim maximally along uh, this direction over here. So we take this direction, we move maximally until we hit the boundary, and then uh, we move again, and we just need two steps. Why with the normal notion of combinatorial diameter, here we would have uh, needed at least three steps. So in a way, circuits are a way to enlarge the set of directions, but uh, still they are, uh, I mean, of course, you can enlarge the set and go inside the polytope. Uh, and, uh, you could move here in this way directly if you want to. But uh, uh, yeah, this is kind of a, go a little bit in between uh, taking all possible direction and just just taking the direction of the edges that, that you are um, that you can see at your current vertex. And uh, yeah, again, this have a nice description. And so they, I mean, in a way, is a set of vector that. Um, that you can somehow manage to describe. And so the circuit diameter is clearly a lower bound on uh, the value of the normal diameter because it gives you more possibility to, to direction to choose in which you have to move. On the other hand, this uh, more flexibility comes at some expenses. And in fact, you lose a lot of combinatorial structure because, for example, polytope with the same combinatorial structure might have dif different uh, circuit diameter values. So it really depends on how you represent your, uh, uh, your polytope. So if you, take, uh, if you take these two polytopes over here, you can see that this one is basically given by stretching a bit this smaller one in this direction. But this now change uh, the number of hopes that you need to go from this vertex to this vertex. So now it's one. But in this case, to go from this vertex to this vertex, then you need more than uh, than one. And this is somehow shows that it's a bit more difficult to, to work with this concept because many nice combinatorial properties that you could try to use by giving bound for the combinatorial diameter here, they might not work anymore. So what I actually find interesting about this, and that's what I really would like to, um, you know, to um, leave uh, as a message today, is that um, I like the fact that one could try to use this more powerful notion of diameters to investigate long-standing conjecture in the literature 
also on the combinatorial diameter. So for example, what about polynomial bound? Do we have polynomial bounds for the circuit diameter? And in fact, I can anticipate that the answer is, is yes. And uh, for a polynomial bound on the circuit diameter actually come uh, quite naturally from uh, some algorithmic results that have been developed uh, using circuits. So the, in the literature, uh, the concept of developing augmentation algorithm based on circuits uh, has been widely studied, not just for uh, LP, but also in, for uh, for IPs. And once again, similar to combinatorial diameter, there are a lot of results here that is hard to mention all. But like there are many, many results in the literature. Like if you think about uh, works of Hameke on uh, Weismantels, Andrea Schulz, uh, Roman Schuf, um, Deloera, Hameke Lee, Borg and Bis, and so on. There are many. And in particular, if I want to mention the one of De Loera, Emek, and Lee, because it's the one we actually uh, ended up using, they proved the following uh, results for, um, for LP inequality form. They proved that if you move, if you have an LP inequality form and you consider an extreme point and move maximally along the circuit that yields the best possible improvement, so if you select the circuit that yields the best possible improvement, then you can reach uh, the optimum uh, solution in weekly polynomially many steps. Let's say that they were not the first to, to have this kind of, um, of um, a convergence. So there was an earlier paper, for example, of McCormick and uh, Shoura in, uh, in 2000 that proved similar results with a slightly different uh, circuit uh, pivot rule. But anyway, all of this to say um, that so there are possibility of selecting the circuit and in particular this one with best improvement it's really in my opinion very natural like you move along the the circuit that gives you the best possible adjacent uh, point and this shows that you can have now weekly polynomial convergence um, to an optimum solution and this is in constant with the simplex so because with the simplex algorithm if you always choose your best neighbor there are a counter examples showing that uh, you need exponentially many steps in that. So now, basically generalizing this type of argument uh, to LP of any form, uh, you can actually get a weekly polynomial bound on the circuit diameter of rational polyhedron. So in particular, uh, there exists a polynomial function uh, that bounds the circuit diameter of any rational polyhedron with the M rows and um, uh, maximum encoding length among the coefficient in its description equal to alpha. So this, so this shows that you can have a weekly polynomial bound on the circuit diameter of, uh, of polytopes. So that's actually good. But what I want to stress once again is the connection that you could have from here or from here to the world of the combinatorial diameter. So if we look at what this result is saying, this one over here, it's basically saying that um, if you are in extreme points and you move along something that gives you the best possible uh, neighbor point, you, you know, with circuit, you can go inside the polytope. So the neighbor is not necessarily a vertex. But anyway, if you move along this, you are able to reach an optimal solution in weekly polynomial in many steps. So how hard is to select the best possible neighbor? Well, it is uh, not too difficult to, to show that selecting the circuit, uh, yes, the best improvement is MP hard, and that's already for the bipartite matching polytope. This is basically the same results that I mentioned before, selecting when I, when I said that if you are at the, an extreme point of the bipartite matching, it's, uh, it's MP hard to decide if you have a, an optimal neighbor that is, um, if you have a neighbor that is an optimal solution, that's basically this is also a circuit direction because circuit is a superset of the normal edge direction so the first part of this really follows from the previous result that i told you on the other hand if you look at the analysis of how the weekly polynomial bound comes you can actually realize that you don't really need necessarily to move along the best improvement circuit you can move along any uh, other type of direction that gives you an alpha approximation uh, with respect to the augmentation. So if the best improvement makes you 
improve your objective function uh, by, by, I don't know, a value of 10. And if you're able to guarantee that you can move along some direction that makes you improve by uh, any polynomial factor of uh, with respect to this 10, then, uh, so basically any alpha approximation algorithm with alpha polynomial in the input still guarantees convergence in polynomial time. You don't really need to take the best. Uh, you, you can actually take any polynomial approximation. And so this actually leads to another type of question, which I actually find particularly interesting. Then can you identify cases in which moving along an edge direction of your polytope is somehow a good approximation of moving along the best improvement circuit? So when is that when you move along an edge, still is guaranteed to, to give you quite comparable to with respect to moving along, along the best improve, improvement circuit. If you can prove that these two augmentations, moving along an edge or moving along a best improvement circuit are a polynomial factor apart, then immediately you would get um, a polynomial, uh, a weekly polynomial bound. And in fact, uh, like we could prove that for zero one polytope that again, zero one polytope are, very well study Hirsch bound holes. So it's not, um, um, I mean, it's not, of course, surprising that you can get something good when you move along the edges. But what I want to light here is that is the machinery that is behind. Like you, you, we were able to prove that moving along the steepest edge direction for a zero one polytope yields convergence to an optimal solution in strongly polynomial time. And again, the way that we did that is that we analyze what happens when you move along a steepest edge on your polytope. And we basically prove that this gives you a good approximation with respect to moving along the best circuit. And uh, so if you can prove this for classes of polytope, then you can rely on the machinery of circuits to prove weekly polynomial bounds. So that's the, the main things that I want to, to convey here. Now, just to uh, finish, uh, main open question is, of course, what happens um, in general. So is the polynomial here conjecture true or is the polynomial pivoting room with the simplex algorithm that uh, remains the main open questions related to the area? Now, going a little bit uh, um, down uh, and, uh, you know, moving in, in deeper in terms of complexity, I want to mention an open problem mentioned in the survey of Kybel and Fesch in 2003. That is, what is the complexity of computing the diameter of the simple of simple polytope? And um, again, this means when you have polytopes that you that uh, basically don't have degeneracy because of the result that I mentioned before are for the generate polytope. And also related for approximation, um, so for circuit diameter. What about approximation algorithm for selecting circuits, at least for some classes of polytope? I just think this could be a good uh, and interesting area of research. And also, what is the complexity of computing the circuit diameter of, uh, of a polytope? And uh, yeah, that's basically concludes my talks. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. So uh, is there uh, some, uh, some questions? So, uh, I have Laura, a uh, Is there still, I mean, any hope to find a, the strong polynomial algorithm for linear programming? I hope, I think, yes, I think a lot. <laughs> Result is, is more difficult, uh, but hope, I think so. Yeah, uh, because I know many people have worked on this question, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely not uh, not an easy question, and also like uh, it's not. I mean, try to prove a bound on the diameter. Uh, it's it's not, of course, the only way to go. Like there are plenty of um, of other ways, like you know, scaling algorithm. If you look about the work, also lots of egg and uh, the, this kind of argument for generalized flows and all these are all different techniques, uh, you know, avatar uh, work uh, and all. So it's, that's not the only way to, to go, clearly. And, and yeah, that's difficult and big. But uh, but in terms of hope, I think, yes, I think, uh, I think there is. Also, like here for the diameter, I also have to say that there is a big difference between, um, uh, between proving a, a, a diameter bound 
and translated it into um, a rule for the simplex because it's not the same thing. Like we have an upper bound that is quasi polynomial for the diameter, but we do not have a quasi polynomial pivoting rule. So also there, there is a step. Uh, even if one could prove polynomial is, is conjecture, you might not be done at all, right? For this, so there are still many things to 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 do. But uh, yeah, hope is there. Uh, I have a question or yeah. two or three. I don't know. With respect to the talk, thank you very much for your very nice talk and very clear. Thank uh, you. Yeah. When you talked about the the, the fractional uh, matching polytope, I just uh, I was guessing about what what is the adjacency between two vertex because I, I didn't see how how this fractional odd cycle behave between two adjacent nodes. Is there some combinatorial property? Yeah, yeah. Do you still see if I write here? Um, I should have put the empty slides, but okay. So yeah, I can give you a, a, a graphical um, characterization of adjacency. So actually, maybe let me see if I have more space. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. So if you so if you take the fractional matching polytope, uh, okay. So you have this these two that are kind of the same adjacency for the integral one clearly. So think about this as vector. So if you think about this as vector from moving from one vertex to another, you can think about the vector in which you put the plus one here, for example, to the black one, and the minus one to the green one, and then zero to the other edges. Like, do, do you see this, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so these, so these are example of, um, of fractional, uh, sorry, of adjacency for the integral matching. So you have basically a cycle in which you have plus and minus one, an even cycle. And then you have a path in which you have plus and minus one. And then for fractional matching, you also have some other things, which is, for example, you take a fractional cycles. Okay. And, uh, and actually, and, and then you move, you can move something like this. For example, the green one would be would be moving this and this, and uh, maybe something like this, and that's the black. So you 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 can have if you think about this, okay. you can have things in which you have. Uh, okay, let me scale it in which you you have so you have two cycles um joined by uh, uh i see yeah I see. joined by a part sorry let me no, yeah I you see. see it i see it's like the, in the match in the uh, in the algorithm of Edmos, the uh, the maximum matching when you he contract the odd cycle right and then he found an augmenting path and then he change uh, in the odd cycle between alternating and to find an alternating path, no? Um, it's not like well, no, it's not. It's not really. So, so technically, what the, what is happening uh, here? So this, sorry, this is plus and this is minus. So is that you take two odd cycles, uh, and actually you can take two odd cycle or even one odd cycle and the other odd cycle being empty. You take two odd cycle joined by a path, and then you kind of. Uh, alternate uh, uh, plus and minus on the cycles and again you, you can always scale a direction so if i let me scale it so that on the cycle you have plus one and minus one and on the path you take twice that so for example an adjacency is given by the following if you have uh, 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 and sorry if you have a fractional uh, cycles odd cycles that only takes uh, uh, everything is 0 0.5 okay you can actually move to an integral a vector in which you have plus just this matching and one node is exposed. So in a way, it corresponds to this type of additions in which this path and this uh, odd cycle is not there. So roughly speaking, let me put it this way. You take these ones that are the adjacency of the integral matching. Now you have some others. This some other type of adjacency, they can involve at most two odd cycles at a time join it by a path. So you can have one odd cycles and one path, or just one odd cycles, or two odd cycles joined 
by one path or two old cycles joined by one vertex. But, so you have a bit more of possibility by considering these old cycles, but that's basically how the edge direction look like. Then you, you, then you reduce the number of fractional odd cycle, right? Correct, correct. Yeah, I have another question. Yeah. Uh, your theorem, when, um, when you have a, a point, a uh, fractional point, and you want to move to the optimal, you said that yeah. the problem is uh, NP hard. Uh, imagine I give you a polytope, and for, 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 a, for a case, for example, when the diameter is a constant, I, uh, the diameter is a constant. Yeah. That the pro is still NP hard also, no? For some cases. So, so um, okay, if, I guess, yeah. Even if the diameter is a constant, I think is hard or? Well, yes, it depends on uh, on the characterization of your polytope. So being a constant, the, I, I'm, I, I'm assuming that, um, like you can have, actually, you can have polytope where the diameter is constant. Like if you take the TSP, uh, the undirected TSP, for example, uh, there the diameter, uh, I mean, is at most four, actually, it's believed to be to be right. two. Well, the On the other hand... The max cut is one, for example. Yeah, exactly. Max cut yeah, is well, one, well, actually. Well, Everyone well, is well. a TSP. The max it's, it's one for complete graphs, but yes, for complete. complete. Yes. Yeah, 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 for complete stuff. For complete graphs. One, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and uh, okay. So for on the other hand, for both these two polytopes that I, that we are mentioning, max cut and TSP, maybe they're not good example because anyway, you don't have a description, so it's kind of uh, you don't really have the set uh, the set of inequality uh, there. Uh, but uh, yeah, but even for example, if we take um, um, if you could have a polytope in which you have a description and you know that the that the diameter is constant. Still, finding a path that brings you there, it's a different story because you could have exponentially many um, uh, many neighbors, so you don't really know where to go. Yes, at least for uh, degenerate, for degenerate polytope. Correct, is. exactly, for the generate yeah. polytope. But yeah. if you are asking me, is that known? Is that officially proven? Uh, uh, then uh, then uh, my, my answer would be no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just the last question about uh, yeah. this adjacency in the C, in the, the is there some uh, com nice combinatorial property about there is of course no adjacency but the move in, in diameter in the circuit in the circuit diameter when you are from so, one point and you move is is there some uh, some yeah. uh, uh, combinatorial property between the two move uh, yeah, okay. So, um, like, for, uh, I guess, like, I can answer for sure, yes, uh, for some specific polytope. Like, for example, uh, if you uh, if you take uh, uh, the, the fractional matching polytope, and that's a very special case, actually, it turns out that uh, the circuits there, they they are precisely the, the current edges of your polytope. So, I mean, you do have... A, they are exactly the same things that I'm describing here. So the set of circuits corresponds to, so you do have a graphical uh, interpretation of circuits because you have a graphical interpretation of the edges. That does not mean that we have a bound or even a, a hardness result on the circuit diameter, because again, you can still um, use this direction and move inside the polytope. And so that's uh, the, the results that I mentioned for fractional matching, they do not translate for, uh, for the circuit diameter. Uh, but in this, uh, this is one case in which we have a very nice and clear description of the circuits, also for flow polytopes and, and, and so on. So there is a graphical interpretation, a combinatorial interpretation. In general, more than saying that these are all the directions that can arise by translating the number of facets, so for very generic polytope, I can't give any other types of, uh, of combinatorial description. Okay. But why, why you call it circuit? Because I don't see circuit. Because you move a facet. Oh, okay. So, um, so okay. For this, uh, maybe I, I should have given the uh, the formal uh, definition of, of circuits. So, so okay. So if you have um, if you have a a polytope of, of of this form, you have a x equal b, and then b x less than or equal to d. So let's say, I mean, every every uh, polyhedron or polytope you can describe it this way. You have some equality, some inequality. 
then uh, the circuits they are going to be uh, to be uh, vector g that satisfies this property so a g is equal to zero so they are in the kernel of a because if you move you have to satisfy yeah. the equality okay and then uh, uh, and then g is support minimal among uh, among the the vector the vector actually uh, bg such that uh, g is in the kernel of a and uh, i mean uh, and we want this to be non zero so if you think about this so if this b is the identity matrix and uh, let's say let's say you you just have uh, x greater than or equal to 0 here or, or less than or equal to zero if you want, it's, it's not the same. Then in a way, if this is the identity matrix, uh, in a way you are basically taking vector in the kernel for which the support is minimal. Okay, yeah. And this basically corresponds to the circuit of the linear matroid of this uh, A. And I think the names comes from, from, from there. Yes. Because it's, it's basically, so in a way these are vector along which you can move if you think about the edges of a polytope, they have some sort of minimality with respect to support, right? You're moving along a ledge, so you're moving to, you're trying to keep a lot of uh, facets tight, and and then you know you're, you're moving from another one. If you take two vertices that are additions, they have a lot of facets in common that are tight. Uh, so so and that's uh, basically where this uh, support minimality is, is giving uh, is giving to you, and I think the if you think about this, then uh, in, in things like this, if you if your B was identity matrix, this would correspond to actually the circuit of, of, of the matroids. And that's also, yeah, that's, I guess, how it comes, where it comes. Yes, even the name is not obvious, huh? Uh, yeah, I mean, let's say that, that could be my fault, right? Because I just define it uh, like informally with this, uh, uh, with this translating of facets, uh, just because I found it more intuitive yeah. if we want to talk about the circuit diameter. Yeah, but think... maybe, yeah, if you start with the normal definition, then maybe the yeah. word circuit, uh, it comes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's more intuitive. All right, I didn't catch it because uh, I, I didn't see any circuit. In yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there uh, some other question? Are there some other question? Okay, so Lorita Tavere, thank you very much for this very, you, very nice very uh, talk and uh, very, very clear talk. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thanks to you for the invitation and sorry if we were a bit over time, but <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. No, no, no. We can applaud. Applaud. I don't. I don't know how we do applause in in video. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> that, uh, it's like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much, Laura. You're welcome. You're welcome. Laura, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.